Vasudeva Shila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Jai. Vishnu Pad Paramahamsa Privajakacharya Stotra Satta Shri Srimad. His Divine Grace Shila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur Maharaj Shila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Jai. Vaishna Vrinda Ki Jai. 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 Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasati Gora Bhakta Vinda Ki Jai Shri Radha Krishna Gopa Gopinath Shama Kund Radha Kund Giri Govardhan Ki Jai Vrindavindan Ki Jai Mayapur Dham Ki Jai Yamuna Mai Ki Jai Ganga Mai Ki Jai Bhakti Devi Ki Jai Tulasi Maharani Ki Jai Samadeva Bhakta Vinda Ki Jai All glories to the assembled devotees Hare Krishna. All glories to the assembled devotees. Hare Krishna. All glories to the assembled devotees. Hare Krishna. All glories to Sri Guru and Sri Guranga. Hare Hare. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya 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 Reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, The Creation, Chapter 11, Lord Krishna's Entrance into Dwaraka, Text 21. Bhagavam Stacha Bandunam, Poranam Anuvartinam, Yatavid Yupasangamya, Sarve Shamanamadade. Bhagavam Stacha Bandhunam Poranam Anuvartinam Yitavid Yupasangam Ya Sarve Shamanam Adade Bhagavam Stacha Bandhunam Poranam Anuvartinam Yitavid Yupasangam Ya Sarve Shamanam Adade Everyone can chant. Hare Krishna. Bhagavan Satatra Bandhu Nam Puranam Anuvarti Nam Yatha Vidya Upasangabhya Sarvesha Manama Adha 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 Hare Krishna. Bhagavan Satatra Bandhu Nam Puranam Anuvartinam Yatha Vityupasangamya Sarvesham Manamadade Hare Krishna Hare Krishna Bhagava Satra Bandhuna Puranam Anuvartinam Yatha Vityupasangamya Sarvesham Manamadade Hare Krishna Hare Krishna. Bhagavan Satra Bandhunam Pauranam Anubartinam Yatha Vidya Upasangamya Sarve Samana Madhade Hare Krishna. Bhagavan Satra Bandhunam Pauranam Anubartinam Yatha Vidya Upasangamya Bhagavam Statra Bandhu Nam Paura Nam Anuvarti Nam Yata Vidyo Pasangamya Sarve Shamanamadade Anyone else? Very good. Word for word translation Bhagavan Sri Krishna, the personality of Godhead, Tatra in that place, Bandhunam of the friends, Puranam 
of the citizens, Anuvardinam, those who approached him to receive and welcome, Yatavidhi, as it behooves, Upasangamya, going nearer, Sarvesham, for each and every one, Manam, honor and respects, Adade, offered. Translation. Lord Krishna, the personality of Godhead, approached them and offered due respect and and offered due honor and respect to each and every one of the friends, relatives, citizens, and all others who came to receive and welcome him. Purport by his divine grace, the Prabhupada. The Supreme Lord Personality of Godhead is neither impersonal nor an inert object, unable to reciprocate the feelings of his devotees. Here the word yatavidhi, or just as it behooves, is significant. He reciprocates just as it behooves with his different types of admirers and devotees. Of course, the pure devotees are of one type only because they have no other object for service but the Lord. And therefore, the Lord also reciprocates with such pure devotees, just as it behooves. Namely, he is always attentive to all the matters of his pure devotees. There are others who designate him as impersonal. And so the Lord also does not take any personal interest. He satisfies everyone in terms of one's development of spiritual consciousness. And a sample of such reciprocation is exhibited here with his different welcomers. Bhagavam Stachabandunam Poranam Anuvartinam Yatavidyu Pasangam Ya Sarvesham Manamadade. Lord Krishna, the personality of Godhead, approached them and offered due, respect, due honor and respect to each and every one of the friends, relatives, citizens, and all others who came to receive and welcome him. Nama Om Vishnu Bidaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Mati Bhakti Dhananta Swami Namaste Saraswati Devi Bhavani Vichai Ne Ne Vishesha Shonivari Pasjada Deja Tarine This is another very beautiful verse painting a very beautiful scene of Lord Krishna's uh, entering Dwaraka after his long, long absence and we heard how all of the residents were so happy to see him uh, all of them, what, first they heard the sound of his uh, conch shell blowing, and they were so excited, but not yet fully satisfied. And then he actually came into the city and they got to see him. And now even more, they're actually all getting to meet him face to face, person to person. They're all getting to meet with Lord Krishna. So what a beautiful scene and what a happy scene for the residents of Dwarka. And all of the residents of Dwarka, all of them, Bandunam. Bandunam means friends and relatives. Um, Krishna is the friend, friend of everyone. He's Dina Bandhu. He's the friend of the poor. He's uh, Arta Bandhu, the friend of the suffering. Uh, Sanatana Goswami calls him Sat Bandhu. In his uh, Brihad Bhagavatam, he uses the term Sat Bandhu, that Krishna is the true friend, the real friend of everyone. But especially in particular in his uh, relationships with devotees in the spiritual world, he has some that are very close friends and relatives. Uh, the Pandavas and Ugrasen and uh, Sadiki and Jiljan and his wives. These are bonded on very, very close. But he's reciprocating perfectly, not just with them, but with all of the residents. Poranam. Poranam. Poranam comes from the word Puri. Puri means city, Dwarka Puri, Jagannath Puri. So just like uh, Kunti becomes Kuntea, Kunti is the mother's name and the son's name, Arjuna, is Kuntea. Uh, so similarly, Puri, you change that to a long vowel, it becomes Poranam, those who are of the city. So all of the, that means all of the citizens, all of the residents of the city were coming forward and personally meeting him. Anuvartinam, 
they were all lined up, all queued up to get their darshan with Krishna, to get their meeting with Krishna. Anuvartinam is nice. You could, uh, you know, if you've, you know, standing in line, being queued up is a horrible experience, but here they're waiting to see Lord Krishna. So you can just imagine how excited everyone is. I'm going to get my chance to meet Lord Krishna. Or just like uh, in previous days, like when Prabhupada would be passing out cookies after a class and everyone would be lining up and waiting their chance to receive a cookie from Prabhupada's hand. So this is Anu Vartanam. They're all lining up. Varta means path. So they're all on the path, all in the row, lined up, waiting to see Lord Krishna. And Upasangam Ya. Upasang, they're all flowing towards Krishna, all approaching Lord Krishna. When I hear this word Upasangam, I'm thinking of the Sangam, the Triveni in India. And the three rivers are all flowing together. The Yamuna, the uh, dark waters of the Yamuna, and the uh, bright uh, white waters of the Ganges, and the unseen hidden waters of the Saraswati, they're all coming together to this one point to form the Triveni, the confluence of these three sacred rivers, making such a holy place. So here's Krishna in the center and all of the friends and all of the citizens are all like, like rivers flowing into the, to the ocean. They're all lining up and coming towards Krishna for that chance to exchange with him. So how nice this is, how sweet this is. Krishna with all his devotees and every single one of them having a chance. I remember uh, l- long ago when I was a Mayavadi in the ashram of uh, a bogus Mayavadi uh, person. And he once said, wrote in one of his books, he says, uh, who, wa- who wants to go to Vaikuntha or Goloka? He said, Krishna's there and all the cowherd boys are around him. But what if you're like at the back of, what if you're, you're at the back of the row? You don't even get to see Krishna. You're, you know, only the ones up close get to see Krishna. So his idea was, oh, you're so far away from Krishna in the spiritual world, better to just merge or become impersonal. Not understanding that Krishna is so unlimited that there's no question of near or far away. He's able to perfectly reciprocate with every single citizen of Dwarka, with every single cowherd boy. All of the cowherd boys, hundreds, thousands, millions of cowherd boys are seated around Krishna. And they were all thinking, oh, Krishna's looking at me. Krishna's with me. Or at the Rasa dance, Krishna expands himself. And every gopi is thinking, oh, Krishna's with me. No one's left out. Oh, there's too many gopis. He'll never, he'll never get a chance to dance with me. No, he's satisfying everyone. And he's reciprocating perfectly with everyone. Even the lower class people. He has his friends. He has his great devotees, his relatives. He's also associating and exchanging very perfectly with all of the citizens. Tomorrow's verse even mentions, what's the word? Ashwapakabia, even the dog eaters, even the low class people, outcasts, unqualified in so many ways, even them, he's meeting with them and he's offered them proper respect and proper exchange according to their position. So this is Krishna's exchange, always perfectly exchanging with everyone. Yatavid he is the word used in the verse. Prabhupada translated as, as it behooves. Uh, Yatavid he literally means according to, the, to Vidi, according to the rules. He's reciprocating perfectly with everyone. Now, according to the rules doesn't mean that Krishna is bound by any rules. Uh, or as it behooves, behooves means that it's something you're, you have to do or you're supposed to do. But Krishna, Natasya Karyam Karanam Chavidyate. Krishna has nothing he has to do, nothing that he is forced to do. He's not bound by rules and regulations. But in this case, he voluntarily accepts the rules and regulations of love, which is the only rules and regulations that actually can bind Krishna. Love for his devotees, love for all of the spirit souls. Therefore, he's reciprocating perfectly with all of them from top to bottom, from the highest down to the lowest of all. Uh, The obvious uh, example of this or the obvious description of this is in Bhagavad Gita. 
ye damam prabhadyante tamstataiva bajam yam manuvart manuvartante manusha partha sarvasha that everyone as they as they surrender unto me i reward them accordingly everyone is following my path in all respects mama vartma again that same word vartma that we have in today's verse anuvartinam in dwarka everyone is voluntarily on the path queued up in line to see krishna but everyone is actually on that path uh, knowingly or unknowingly mama vartma anuvartante Everyone is following Krishna's path, whether they know it or not. And if they don't know it, then Krishna is reciprocating with them in a certain way. If they are demonic or mayavadi and try to reject that path, he still reciprocates them appropriately in a certain way. And if they're a loving devotee, then he uh, reciprocates with them perfectly in that way also. In today's verse, in the purport, I'm sorry. Uh, says, let me see if I can quickly find this. The Lord also reciprocates with such pure devotees just as it behooves. Namely, he is always attentive to all the matters of his pure devotees. So this is how he reciprocates with the pure devotees. But he reciprocates exactly perfectly with everyone, even those who are not devotees. He goes on in the purport. There are others who designate him as impersonal, and so the Lord does not take any personal interest. They're impersonal to him. He's impersonal to them. It, that's also perfect reciprocation. And those who are sinful and rascals in different ways, he uh, sends them to the material world. And that's also a perfect reciprocation, which we'll uh, get into a little bit later. Uh, so this is Krishna. He's uh, perfect perfect in how he gives everyone exactly what they deserve and exactly what they want and exactly what they're asking for. Um, and especially sweet is with his devotees, of course. There's the story in Mahabharat after the uh, supposed death of the Pandavas and the burning of the house of Lak. Most people thought they had been burned and died and then they were in hiding and then they were in exile. And then they were in disguise in the kingdom of Virat. Was it kingdom of Virat? Um, and then finally, they, the exile was over and they came back to uh, Indra Prashta. And everyone was so happy to see them again. And when Krishna found out that they were alive and they were back in, back in the city and back there, he immediately went to visit them. And when he visited them, also he offered this perfect example, Yata Vidhi, perfect example of how to respect them. Uh, this is a verse from that description. Yudhishthirasya bhimasya kritva pada bivandanam palgunam parirabhyata yamabhyam chabivandita. So Yudhishthirasya bhimasya. Yudhishthir and Bhim, those are the two of the Pandava brothers who are older than Krishna, senior to Krishna. Kritva Padabhi Vandanam. Krishna actually bowed down to them and touched their feet because he considered, he was considering these are my devotees, but they're in the position, they're elder brothers, elder cousins. So he was offering respect as a junior does to an elder. Uh, Palgunam. Parirabhyata. Palgun is the name of Arjuna. Arjuna, who was the same age, same status as Krishna, they embraced in love. They were embracing in love. And Yama Bhyam Chabivandita. Yama Bhyam means the two twins, uh, uh, Nikul and Sahadev. They were offering their humble obeisances to the lotus feet of Krishna. So, in this way, although in one sense it's, you could say, oh, it's a material calculation older or younger who's older or younger than krishna but because that's the relationship he had with the devotees he was perfectly reciprocating yata vidhi and doing it in such a way not just to follow some mundane rules but in a way that fed and uh, accentuated the loving relationship he had with his devotees so with his devotees he reciprocates so beautifully 
and so perfectly with all of his devotees. Um, and in the material world, we heard in the purport how, how Krishna reciprocates with the impersonalists by being impersonal to them. You want impersonal? Okay, impersonal. You merge into Brahma Jyoti, you give up material life and get whatever uh, happiness, which is not actually a positive happiness. It's just an happiness, an absence of material misery. You get that, but you get no personal reciprocation. You don't get to see my face here. On, we'll hear in a few weeks in Ishopanishad, Hiran Mayena Patrena, how the devotee actually wants to see Krishna's face and wants the impersonal feature removed. That's also the reciprocation with what the devotee wants or what the Mayavadi wants. So with the impersonalist, he's reciprocating perfectly. And in the material world, he's also reciprocating perfectly with each and every single living entity. He's not limited to reciprocate with the five Pandavas or with the however many millions of people were living in Dwaraka. He's reciprocating on an intimate, individual, and perfect level with each and every single jiva that there is, which are countless. I think what's the word of Sankhita? I think it says in Bhagavad Gita that they're countless. You can't count how many living entities there are. So he does that perfectly even in the material world. And this material world itself is a sign and a manifestation of his loving reciprocation with the living entities. If a living entity is, does not want to accept Krishna as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, as the Supreme Enjoyer, as the best friend, as the only true object of love, and thinks, why, thinks, why should I do this? Let me be the center. Krishna reciprocates. You want to do that? You obviously won't be happy in the spiritual world where everyone is loving Krishna, that would imagine, you know, that would be so unpleasant for someone who is rejecting Krishna. So here I've created this entire creation, not just creation, but he comes as uh, Maha Karanadakashai Vishnu in this gigantic form. And he has all countless, countless, uni as there are countless living entities, there are even countless universes coming from the pores of his body. And he enters into each of those universes as uh, uh, Garbhadakashai Vishnu, as the soul of the universe. And Lord Brahma, he sprouts the lotus flower and Lord Brahma comes and creates all of the material manifestation and the bodies of all the living entities. And he furthermore manifests as Kiradakashai Vishnu as the super soul, the Paramatma in the heart of every single living entity. And he never leaves the living entity alone for even a moment. He's always with him and guiding him. Okay, you, for, you forgot me. You're forgetting the spiritual world. Okay, here you go. You become a Brahma. You become an Indra. You become a, a stool-eating hog. You become a human. And Krishna's with you all the time and guiding. And if you do something good, he's reciprocating with good karma. And if you do something bad, he's reciprocating with bad karma. But at the same time, he's doing it all, not just by blind justice, but he's arranging it all in such a way to ultimately bring us back to his lotus feet through the process of devotional service. Therefore, he comes, he brings his shastra, he descends as his holy name, and especially he sends his devotees to this material world to preach to everyone and remind us of what we've forgotten. When Prabhupada went to England, he was being, his first trip to England, he was being interviewed by one newspaper. And a and, uh, uh, reporter said, Swamiji, why have, you, why have you come here? He said, I've come to teach you what you have forgotten. So this is all the devotees come to teach us. We've forgotten. We've forgotten Krishna, but Krishna never forgets us because he does so much, so much arrangement to bring us back. So this is also his beautiful, loving 
It's yatavid he, but it's all based on love, his love for the living entities to ultimately bring them back uh, for his happiness and for our ultimate happiness. So this is karma. This is the material world. This is also part of Krishna's loving reciprocation. Um, and then there's, again, reciprocation with his devotees, where again, I'll quote Prabhupada says, always attentive to all the matters of the pure devotees. So he's especially attentive to, to those who are uh, his devotees, those he never forgets. He never forgets anyone, but the devotees, naturally, this is also reciprocation, that he's especially attentive to those who are especially attentive to him. Uh, just like, again, with the example of Yudhishthira and the Pandavas, Yudhishthira did not want Krishna offering obeisances to him he, because he's always feeling himself a servant and subordinate to Krishna. But still he accepts it and Krishna does it and it's deepening their loving relationship. Uh, because this is what Krishna wants. This is Krishna's goal. Ananda Mayo Vyasat, Brahman, the spiritual energy, and ultimately the personality of Godhead is by nature, Ananda Mayo. Opposed of nothing but Ananda, bliss. So this bliss is Krishna's uh, raison d'etre, his reason for existence. And because we're part and parcel of Krishna, it's also our reason for existence. So therefore, out of this love, out of this pleasure principle, Krishna is reciprocating with his devotees and his devotees are reciprocating with him. And you can't actually say who is getting more pleasure, Krishna or the devotees. And why Krishna is reciprocating with the fallen souls also to bring them away from the false happiness and actual suffering of this material world into the real happiness of a spiritual relationship with him, which will give them unlimited happiness and also increase his unlimited happiness. And this is so uh, desirable for Krishna and so much at the center of Krishna's being that when he's with a devotee who truly loves him, he actually feels himself as unable to reciprocate proper, properly. Krishna can always reciprocate perfectly, but with these advanced devotees, he feels his inability. He said to the gopis, you've given up everything. You've left your home, your family. You've sacrificed your good reputation. You've given up religious principles just to serve me. I cannot repay you. I, I have to remain your debtor. I cannot repay, repay you. Even if I had the life of Brahma span of time in which to repay you, I cannot repay you. So this is how Krishna feels. And Krishna feels he cannot reciprocate properly with his devotees. And the devotees also feel that they cannot reciprocate properly with Krishna. So this in itself is a perfect reciprocation that they're each feeling an inability to reciprocate properly. This is just another phase of reciprocation. Just like separation is just another phase of meeting. All of these seeming incongruities are resolved in pure devotional service. Krishna is Om Purnam. We heard again in Ishopanishad three weeks ago, I think. Om Purnam, Madak Purnam Idam. That Krishna is complete. And he's so complete that even though unlimited complete units are emanating from him, he's not reduced in any, in any way. He remains complete. But that completeness also works in reverse or in the other direction. That Krishna is complete and Krishna is full in every way. So when the devotees offer him love, you can think, oh, if he's full, there's no room for more. If you have a full cup and if you pour more in it, it spills over. But his fullness also works in the other direction, that he's so full of bliss. He's bliss by nature. He's happy by nature. And he has so many unlimited devotees already serving him. And he's so full in that happiness and love and bliss of relationship with the devotees. But when another devotee comes and offers more, he accepts that also without overflowing or exploding or bursting like a material container would. 
and he accepts more and more and he wants more and more love from his devotees. And at the same time, he's offering more and more love to his devotees and to all the conditioned souls. So this is uh, this very beautiful reciprocation of Krishna with, with his devotees, especially, and with all the living entities. Um, here's a, this is a nice uh, dis description from teachings of Queen Kunti about the nature of uh, Krishna's unlimited desires to enjoy and his unlimited desires to give and reciprocate with his devotees. This is from teachings of Queen Kunti. Prabhupada writes, Now, when Krishna brought the girls back home to his capital city, it is not that each of the 16,000 wives had to wait 16,000 nights to meet Krishna. Rather, Krishna expanded himself into 16,000 forms, constructed 16,000 palaces, and lived in each palace with each wife. Although this is described in Srimad Bhagavatam, rascals cannot understand this. Instead, they criticize Krishna. He was very lusty, they say. He married 16,000 wives. But even if he is lusty, he is unlimitedly lusty. God is unlimited. Why 16,000? He could marry 16 million and still not reach the limits of his perfection. That is Krishna. We cannot accuse Krishna of being lusty or sensuous. No, there are so many devotees of Krishna and Krishna shows favor to all of them. Some ask Krishna to become their husband. Some ask Krishna to become their friend. Some ask Krishna to become their son. And some ask Krishna to become their playmate. In this way, there are millions and trillions of devotees all over the universe. And Krishna has to satisfy them all. He does not need any help from these devotees, but because they want to serve him in a particular way, the Lord reciprocates. These 16,000 devotees wanted Krishna as their husband, and therefore Krishna agreed. So this is the beauty and the exchange of love between Krishna's and his devotees. And in this verse today, we get such a nice uh, view of how that's going on. Uh, so when we understand this principle, at least to some degree, understand it and appreciate this principle of how Krishna reciprocates, when we can appreciate this a little bit, then we can actually engage in devotional service because this is the essence of what devotional service is. That you, uh, whatever, you have something, you offer it to Krishna. You have a desire, you offer it to Krishna. You want to eat something, you offer it to Krishna. You want to enjoy something, you offer it to Krishna. Yad karosi, yad asnasi, yad jahosi dadati yat, yat tapasir konteya, tat karushra madarpanam. Krishna says, you want to eat, you want to do, you want to perform austerities, you want to receive something, you want to give something. All madarpanam, you all offer to Krishna. And the devotee is never a loser by offering to Krishna. Rather, the devotee becomes the gainer because Krishna reciprocates so wonderfully and with so much love. The devotee feels himself a gainer a hundred thousand million times over. That we offer some little, little something. You offer a little something, a leaf. You offer a leaf to Krishna. And Krishna is so indebted to the devotee for that. And, and this leaf, just like there's the story in Mahabharat of Draupadi and her magic cooking pot that uh, she would prepare in this cooking pot and it would produce unlimited, it would produce unlimited prasad un that would feed as many people uh, as came on until she took, and after she took, she would take last, and then it would be done. So to start, we know the story how uh, the uh, Dur <laughs> well Duryodhana sent, yeah, Duryodhana sent Durvasta to visit the Pandavas, thinking that he came with all his disciples, and the Pandavas wouldn't be able to feed him, and in that way, the Pandavas would be cursed. And actually, he came. 
with all his disciples. And he said, yes, Maharaj, thank you for visiting. Go bathe and then we'll feed you. And the Pandavas went to Draupadi and she said, uh-oh, I already, I already ate. The pot is empty. What are we going to do? We can't feed Durvasa and all his disciples. He's going to become angry. He's going to be, curse us. And then Krishna say, came and he said, are you sure the pot is empty? And she looked and she got one little tiny bit of prasad left in the pot. And I don't know if this is scriptural, but in Mauritius, they say that that one little bit of prasad was one single leaf of, in, in Mauritius, they call baton, the drumstick tree. Everyone knows drumsticks. Moringa. Huh? Moringa. Moringa. Also in, in Vrindavan, they call sajai kapal. And the leaves are also eaten. It has little, little leaves. And she found one little leaf, pacha, stuck to the side of the pot. And, offered, and Krishna said, oh, give that to me. And Krishna ate it. And he was so satisfied just by that one little leaf, that one little scrap of prasad. And because all the living entities are his part and parcel, Dorvasa and all of his hundreds, thousands, millions of disciples also felt fully satisfied. And they thought, oh, we're so full. If we go to the Pandavas and they offer us food and we don't accept it, that'll be offense on our part. So instead, they all left. They all ran away. And the Pandavas were saved. Because this is Krishna's reciprocation. You give a leaf, pachram pushpam palam tayam. Such a little offering, but it means so much. Another beautiful Bhagavatam story is in the uh, uh, 10th canto. The, uh, the uh, forest-dwelling lady who is selling her fruits. Actually, we say story. It's really just like one or two verses in the Bhagavatam describing this. That this uh, lady would collect fruits in the jungle. And she would go to the villages and, and sell them. She would call out. Uh, she was calling out in the village. Krinihi bo palani ti. Krinihi bo palani ti. Said, oh, residents of Vrindavan, who will come and buy some of my fruits? And it's very nice. Uh, she's selling her fruits like this door to door. And Lord Krishna uh, heard, the, heard that cry. And he went to get some fruits. And in this verse, it's very nice. Krishna himself is called Sarva Palam Prada. The lady is the fruit wala, the pala salesperson. But Krishna is Sarva Pala Prada. He's the person who awards all fruits to everyone. And Krishna had seen how his parents would buy fruit, that they would take some grain or some uh, rice or some grain or some wheat and trade it for fruits because um, Mostly barter system was in, uh, was in effect at that time. So Krishna, he was a little baby. So he wanted some fruit. So he grabbed some handful of grains in his tiny little hands. And he went running out to meet the fruit lady. And as he's running, he's a baby. What can he do? His hands are not holding the grains very well. And as he's running, the grains are falling out of his hands. And he goes up to the fruit lady and extends his palm. And there's only like maybe two or three, two or three little grains of rice <laughs> left in the palm of his hand. But when that woman saw Krishna and his beauty, and she was just so fell in love with that beautiful child, she offered all of her basket of fruit. She offered all of it to Krishna. And then when she looked down at her empty basket, she saw that, oh, now it's all full of gold and jewels and precious things like that. So this is Krishna's reciprocation. That you offer a little fruit to Krishna. Patram pushpam palam toyam. And Krishna's reciprocation is so immense. We may not and probably won't get gold and jewels and whatever like that. But Krishna will reciprocate so perfectly in a way to increase our devotion. And that was what the, that was what the uh, fruit selling lady actually got. Not that she got any gold, but that she uh, got pure love of Krishna. And... Uh, not in the Bhagavatam, but B Dina Bandhu describes how after that, that woman, she just left and she went into the forest singing. Uh, Govinda Damo Dharama Daviti. Govinda Damo Dharama Daviti. Describing it as only Dina Bandhu Prabhu can. And that was the real reciprocation, the real gift he got. So Prabhupada is, I'm sorry, uh, Krishna is reciprocating so amazingly 
And again, this is the this is the basic principle of devotional service, a loving exchange. Exchange means reciprocation. Dadati prati guyanati, bhuntaya bhoja te chaiva, guyamakiti prichati. It's exchange. And with devotees also, and it's, it's an exchange back and forth. It's not one-sided. There's a religious doctrine that uh, used to be popular, uh, especially in America. The founding fathers were mainly adherents of this, a, a religious doctrine called deism. And deism is the doctrine that God exists, that there's a supreme God and he created everything, but he has no reciprocation. He doesn't have anything to do with this material world. He doesn't have anything do with, to do with our lives. So if you accept that, even though it, it accepts that there's a God, but what's the meaning of that? A God that you can't reciprocate with is, what's the point? What's the purpose? What, what, why would you pray to such a being? Why would you offer anything to such a being if there's no reciprocation? So this is not Krishna consciousness. Krishna consciousness is based on this loving reciprocation. Just like one final example, Prabhupada, when he came to America and he landed, he first landed in Boston Harbor and he took a little walk around town. Now, if you go to Boston Harbor today, it's really fancy. There's big hotels and convention centers and tourist spots and everything is clean and far out and opulent and nice. But I used to live in Boston and back in the 80s, the Boston Harbor was nasty. I used to walk down there just because Prabhupada had arrived there just to see it. And at that time, before the city poured billions of dollars into it to turn it into a tourist attraction, it was a nasty, nasty part of town. Dirty and warehouses and you know, dive bars and prostitutes walking the street. And what a horrible, horrible place. And that was what it was like when Prabhupada arrived. And he walked around the city and he came back and he wrote that poem. He wrote a poem, my dear Lord Krishna, I'm paraphrasing. I don't know why you have brought me here to this horrible place. Everyone is sunk in the lower modes of ignorance and passion. But you want me to come here. I'll do my best to preach to them. I'm just like a puppet in your hands. So Lord, make me dance, make me dance. Krishna, make me dance as you like. So this is also the reciprocation that the devotee is completely surrendering himself to Krishna. And Krishna reciprocates by empowering the devotee. Look at what Prabhupada was able to do. He came and he was actually kind of hopeless, seeing this horrible, ignorant place. And even he would, uh, when he established himself in the Bowery in New York and was settled in a little, he wasn't having that much success. He was trying and sometimes he would go back to the shipping agent and inquire, oh, when's the next bo boat going back? Thinking, oh, maybe I should just go back to India. And he would do that several times. And then after some time, the shipping agent said to him, Swamiji, you're always inquiring. <laughs> you're always inquiring when the next boat returning is, but you never return. You never get on the boat and go back because he was so determined to carry out this mission given by Krishna and by his spiritual master. And it took a little time, but actually not that much time. And Krishna reciprocated and empowered him in such a way to form this beautiful, amazing Krishna consciousness movement, International Society for Krishna Consciousness, which is based, this is one of the, uh, how many is it? five or seven, I can't remember now, the seven founding principles of Krishna consciousness. And one of them is for the purpose of loving exchanges between the devotees and with Krishna. This is, the, I think, the first principle. So this is what Prabhupada has given us, this ability, this knowledge to understand that Krishna is there and not only exists, but he's so sweet, his holy name and his pastimes, Nama, Rupa, Guna, Lila, are all so sweet and so attractive that we must approach him and not just approach him, but as we take a step towards Krishna, he takes a step or a hundred steps or a million steps towards us because it's a reciprocation. And that reciprocation, like the Dwarka Vasis, is the essence of devotional service. And that's what we uh, see in this verse, if we can get inspired by it. 
and by the example of Srila Prabhupada, this is what devotional service is really all about. Thank you very much, Hare Krishna. Is there any question or comment or discussion? Hare Krishna, Acharya Prabhu. Please accept the humble obeisances. Such a wonderful class, such a wonderful topic, and such a wonderful class, and so nicely presented. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Many points um, that touched me, and you know, uh, especially the last one about Srila Prabhupada coming. Um, I was just thinking uh, how Krishna reciprocates. I mean, both from the devotee side and from the Lord side. Srila Prabhupada was so determined, you know, things were um, completely not in favor of him, but still he went on, he didn't give up. He, and so I'm just trying to understand the mood of the devotee. Uh, he will do anything until the last minute just to please Krishna, whatever he has, whether he sees the results or not. And depending on the devotee's um, uh, determination and dedication, Krishna is also reciprocating, as you quoted so many times. And uh, one lecture that I was listening to yesterday, uh, another part of devotee's uh, service to Krishna is, it's not just about what I do. It's also about how I appreciate what other devotees are doing. Uh, because when I see that the success of another devotee is not just that person's success, but it is all of our success. It's the success of, you know, just like when you glorify Krishna, that glorification is benefiting everyone. Mm, nice. So similarly, uh, when I am able to feel happy for another devotee who is, uh, you know, glorifying Krishna, then I am also be I also become a recipient of Krishna's reciprocation. So uh, the story about the, the the fruit vendor, that was so wonderful. Just everything, the class was so good. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's a nice point that we're, we're not alone. First of all, we're not alone where there's Krishna. So we're reciprocating with Krishna, but it's not just a single line back and forth. We're also surrounded like you were saying in a community of devotees, and it's more like a web of reciprocation with the devotees and the devotees with Krishna and the devotees with each other. And we're all serving each other and appreciating each other and all of it directed towards Krishna. So it's a whole uh, web, a world, <laughs> worldwide web of reciprocation that we become entangled in. So I like that, that's a nice point. Thank you. Anything else, question or discussion? Yes, go right ahead. Hare Krishna Prabhuji, thank you for uh, bringing up this point, sir. Thank you for that. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, I was uh, one of them is a little bit uh, beyond today's uh, discussion, but couple of the, um, the first one is um, uh, just uh, discussing with some of the people and uh, in the uh, argument or discussion. Um, there was a point made that uh, there are four uh, principles uh, which ISKCON kinds of promote, um, uh, mostly uh, not avoid intoxication, illicit sex. Um, um, the, the third one is um, gambling. Gambling and the fourth and one. Meat one. Eating. And meat yeah. eating. Yeah. So in, when I, I'm just trying to say those things to people, uh, who who even does not have the background of ISKCON or anything like that, but it, it generally helps uh, people to uh, progress. I'm sorry, you're a little, I'm not hearing you. IT, like uh, in terms of welfare. So if this... I'm not sure if it's uh, your connection or mine, but Hello. your 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 voice Hello. is fading yeah. out. Yeah, Hare Krishna, Hello. Hello. Can you you hear me? Out. Do you hear us? Hello. Hear me? I can hear you. 
uh, you are you are cutting in between so if you can rephrase your question so that will be nice. you can you hear me now clearly yeah it's better yes. now okay okay sorry i apologize i don't know what it was so uh so so let me put so we were discussing that four points uh, i the think four so four principles you, yes so uh, i was also saying i was putting into the context who i'm talking with uh, the audience here and uh, they fully don't uh, have the faith on krishna on the iskon movements or etc so knowing that that is the audience and they uh, they think um, uh, one of the point was uh, just uh, like i was saying about the meat eating right how why meat eating is uh, not prescribed in the vedas and, uh, and vedas are the highest authorities we need to follow that um, if we are following uh, our hinduism or sanatan dharma or uh, in that case so putting that for, point forward one of the question came the there are many uh, geographical locations uh, where vegetarian foods are difficult to grow uh, like for example we can say alaska is an example for understanding um so alaska is one of them maybe saudi arabia is another another extreme um where the heat is more so how do we uh, explain like uh, the vedas their highest truth and uh, so that was my one of the question like uh, people are okay. really into meat eating of that so i have another question if you can answer this let me let me address that one first if that's okay yeah one thing one thing that i might say to such a person is that well where do you live do you live in alaska do you live at the north pole do you live in the desert and presumably not so so even if he has a theoretical objection like that that doesn't apply to him he's that means he's looking for an excuse um that's that's what i might say to such a person that don't don't worry about what the rest of the world what someone is doing in alaska what are you doing okay but uh, i mean that uh, uh, i mean people are logical and they they try to think uh, they want to be understand they think in the sense um uh, that we are, i mean telling telling somebody what is right and wrong um it's it's a judgment uh, by human not so we, when we talk yeah, so, about vedas so vedas are, uh, so don't tell them what's right and wrong help them to understand themselves what's right and wrong any anyone can understand that for example meat eating you want to talk about meat eating if you don't accept krishna or you don't accept the vedas but anyone in the universe can understand that animals are living beings so do you really think that it's worth causing suffering to other living beings just so you can eat something that you don't not only don't need to eat to live but will be healthier without eating it so if a person doesn't accept that or doesn't understand that there's not really much you could say to such a person if they want to eat meat they're going to eat meat but uh anyone can understand that it's cruel that it's killing animals those same people probably keep a cat or a dog in their house and are and are shed, uh pouring so much love and affection on their cat and dog but if they think it's okay to kill a different animal and eat it and they're not willing to listen to reason what can you do you're you're we're all limited in our ability to influ- influence others they could understand it or not they can accept it or not and as far as the world if you go to saudi arabia if you go to the supermarket you'll find plenty of vegetables if you go to alaska any any grocery store will have plenty of vegetables you could buy rice and you can buy flour in alaska anywhere you go it's not very difficult to be vegetarian that's that shouldn't really be much of an issue if yeah, someone yeah. won't let go if someone won't let go of meeting eat of meeting of eating meat uh that shows that that person is has no real interest in not only in logical discussion but in uh any kind of spiritual or even moral advancement because it's a very simple thing to understand yeah but, it's true but uh, they were uh, they were also seeing in terms of evolution 
like uh, you know, how how the society evolved and maybe in current times the alaskas are having fully equipped with uh, because the air transportation is possible and all but uh, in the olden good days uh, probably... but those do- those days are gone that person yeah. should worry about what they are doing now not worry about the whole world my wife yes. is raising her hand she has a comment very quickly one time somebody asked about how many members in your movement and this and that if you are flying somewhere, you're buying a ticket. Do you require how many passengers in the car? You buy your ticket and you go. No, whatever else. Nice. Did, did everyone hear that? Not clearly. Yeah. Was... That one time someone asked Prabhupada, how many members do you have? And Prabhupada said, if you're flying somewhere and you're buying a ticket to go, do you inquire how many other people are buying tickets? Don't worry about who else is buying a ticket. If you want to go somewhere, you buy your ticket and go. So to, I, don't, I don't know the person you were speaking to me, but to me, it just sounds like an excuse. What's your second question? Second question was, um, um, this was, oh, sorry, I, I was having that thing in my mind. Um, uh, it just slipped out of my mind. Um, okay, we could. Someone else can ask, and we could come back to you. Yeah, sure. Okay, my wife is here. She has a question. Go ahead. I was thinking of the worst. Some of them said that they did. Man, I got because here, they present to my husband. My husband is I don't envy anybody. I'm not talking about anybody. Uh, I can. Uh, my wife brought up the verse Samoham Sarvabhuteshu that he's equal to everyone, but he's a special friend to his devotee. So that's reciprocating. That's the perfect reciprocation. He, he's reciprocating because the devotees are offering special affection to him. He's offering special affection to them. If, the, like Prabhupada mentioned, the Mayavat, the impersonalists in today's purport, that the impersonalists are being impersonal to him. So he's very perfectly not envious. He's reciprocating perfectly with them by being impersonal to them. And if someone is turning away from Krishna and wants to enjoy material life, he sends them to the material world where they could completely forget Krishna and completely pursue material life. He's the, that's his perfect reciprocation with everyone. Uh, reciprocation but he's so intelligent that even those who are against him, he arranges thing in, things in such a way to eventually rectify them and bring them back to his lotus feet. But that's the, still the perfect reciprocation that especially with the devotees because they are special with him. So that's reciprocation. Is that, is that okay? Okay, anything else, question or comment? I think Kalpes Prabhu is back uh, having the hand raised. Go ahead, Kalpes okay. Prabhu. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Go ahead, please. Uh, so the question I have, um, yeah, so we all are educated class mostly who are attending these classes. But uh, we, in, when we look at the uh, footprint of map, uh, there are different segments of people who are not so uh, um, like uh, educated uh, in terms of uh, the school education part of it uh, and uh, they may not have access to these ISKCON moments as well and uh, the, at the same time they are in, involved in their daily life just for survival mostly and trying to make money and trying to sustain the family uh, how do we give them Krishna consciousness knowing that they may not be um, uh, reading Bhagavata Gita, they may not be reading Srimad Bhagavatam, and uh, at the same time, they may not have that much understanding to read uh, and understand this and come to the Krishna conscious movement. And knowing this, all parameters, and if they want, we want to take them to elevate their journey of soul. How would how would that? What is the process for those people? For uh, it's really the same process. You say they're not reading Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavatam. So you give them. You go and you distribute and give them. Here's Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavatam. 
You don't have to be a MABA PhD to read and understand Bhagavad Gita. Prabhupada came and preached to the hippies who were not particularly qualified in any way, but by his example and by his determined preaching and also reason and argument and logical and intellectual preaching as well, and also by giving prasad and giving books and giving loving relationship, he made them into devotees. Uh, you don't need a college education to understand any of this. In fact, a, a college education can be detrimental. Bhakti Vinod Thakur said, the more mundane education you have, the more you become an ass. So that, that shouldn't really be an obstacle. It shouldn't be an obstacle for them, for the persons, whether college educated or not. And it shouldn't be an obstacle to us in our preaching that, oh, I only, I only preach to college people or I only preach to this or that. Prabhupada didn't discriminate like that. He preached to whoever, whoever was willing to hear, he preached to. So we should be willing like that. And, and if we look at the devotees in our movement, we didn't all come from you know high class, intellectual, this or that. It came from all, all classes of society, all uh, levels of society. Everyone's qualified. We heard, uh, we were discussing last week or the week before, I can't remember, that the only qualification to take up devotional service is a little bit of shraddha, a little bit of faith. So if you could give someone a little faith that, oh, this book is nice, this philosophy is nice, this uh, samosa or whatever prasad is nice, then that's the beginning of one's devotional service. And uh, the educated person is not necessarily more or less qualified than the uneducated person. Everyone's, everyone can take. In fact, there's, Prabhupada has often said that it's much easier to preach to a, uh, to a poor man or a simple man than it is to a big sophisticated person. So it could, it could go both ways, but ultimately everyone is qualified and we should preach to everyone who we find to be qualified to take up or at least to listen. But, at, but take also taking what you said, it's also true that Prabhupada also at the same time also very much liked and very much uh, advocated his devotees uh, to do college preaching because it's young, young people. Young people, they're in college, they're at an age where they're maybe inquisitive, they're an age at an age where they're interested in different things. So he also liked college preaching in general, but he also wanted preaching to everyone. Is that okay? Yeah, and I was more uh, focusing on the people who are fishermen communities. Uh, they, they are like uh, fully soaked into alcohol, immersed into alcohol, their daily lives. And, uh, and there are several segments of people, uh, particularly in India, of Agri, Vagri, and all those. So there are too much, uh, I mean, they are socially so much uh, discriminated uh, and, um, and not having that, uh, uh, like, I mean, concept of God in their head and, and not going into too much heavy philosophy, uh, which they can not really actually come, I mean, come to the, at the right I mean, first place, they cannot accept it. So what is that baseline thing they can start with something, you know? It's the same uh, thing. Okay. It's the same uh, thing. You, anyone can understand. And if they either can't understand or they're not willing to understand, mm. you don't, you know, don't need any intelligence to, to honor Prasad. You don't need any intelligence to chant Hare Krishna. Just do that. In fact, in, in preaching and in college preaching, Prabhupada many times said that, these people, they can't understand any philosophy, just do kirtan and prasadam distribution. So that works for everyone, from the biggest intellectual to the lowest whatever. But we shouldn't make these distinctions higher and lower. We should just make a distinction. Here's a spirit soul, part and parcel of Krishna. Let me in whatever little way I can give them some access to Krishna consciousness by preaching, by a book, by kirtan, by prasad, whatever. And then as you preach to those people, you'll see, you'll gain experience what sort of preaching will work better for mm, that's which right. community yeah. or which person or which type of person. That's correct. So I was thinking in line, I think so we, we are on the same page. On, like I was thinking what can be the better way 
find a but yes i agree with that okay yeah. the last question i had uh, i was also asked uh, is um, so many times people it's getting late at, so it's getting late so make this a brief one please sure so uh, third one is uh, the many time uh, the people see it, uh, the 16 rounds of uh, hari krishna chanting is the only way so is that chanting is the only one thing or they have to it's a how chanting would work uh, in the combination of other other things like reading bhagavatam shrimad bhagavad gita trying to participate go in the devotee association uh, what what are the rules for that Uh, what are the rules? Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says that there's no hard and fast rules. Just somehow or other, you start chanting Hare Krishna. That's the the bottom line. Is that there's no rules. You chant Hare Krishna, and it'll be good for you, and it'll be purifying to you. But if you want to become serious, if you want to take advantage of the chanting and taste the benefits of the chanting more and more, then you should also be. uh purifying your life in different ways like by the four regulative principles you should be associating with devotees you should be learning philosophy worshiping the deity all these different things will make the chanting make us realize the power of the chanting more and more but the chanting also stands on its own as independently powerful but as we practice more and more the chanting will purify us and then we'll want to practice more and more okay. and then when we practice more and more then we'll realize the the beauty of the chanting more and more and they'll feed each other is that okay okay uh thank you very much everybody hari krishna is there any announcements or Temple announcements for today. I was given one of the yeah. I was given one of the feedback that one of the gentlemen. Uh, yeah, thank you, Kalpesh Prabhu. Uh, so uh, it will be good if you can come to temple. We'll meet and we'll you know have the quest many questions clarified in the separate times. So Dhanacharya Prabhu, uh, is there any announcement? Please go ahead. Sure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Acharya Prabhu, I was I, as you, as you were talking about that, it reminded me of um, in the purport to 1855, Shiva Prabhupada writes about university degrees. Um, I'll just read just two sentences real quick. Yeah, he please. says um, he has not revealed to anyone to everyone. No one can understand God simply by erudite scholarship or mental speculation. Mm-hmm. Only one who is actually engaged in Krishna consciousness. and devotional service can understand Krishna, who krishna is university degrees are not helpful um, nice it's so just nice. confirm and, and i'm not saying that just because i dropped out <laughs> um uh, but today today's the ekadashi just want to remind everybody it's a day for um fasting from beans and grains um increasing your devotional activity um And tonight uh, we have our Sunday feast program starting at 4:30. We will be joined by His Grace Anutama Prabhu, um, our GBC for Philadelphia. He's also the director of ISKCON Communications. Um, he will be giving the class. We'll be continuing our series on Ish- the Sri Yeshu Panishad. Um, tonight will be part four. I think we'll be studying mon- Mantra six. So we hope to see you all there for Kirtan at 4:30. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Vacha Kalpa to Vyascha. Give us a new day. Thank you. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Everybody have a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.